everyone and welcome into the Market Scale Studios. I'm Tyler Kern. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a fabulous guest. His name is Adrian Thomas. He's the president and CEO of Datascan. And we're going to be discussing the importance of inventory accuracy for retailers worldwide. So Adrian, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Tyler. Excellent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited to talk about this topic because I think um, this was an important topic before, but COVID-19 has really brought this to a larger level of relevance uh, these days because it's forced all of us to adjust our routines and what our normal looks like, especially as it, as it relates to retail. Um, so how have you seen buyer behavior trends emerge during COVID-19 and maybe shift and change during this time? Yeah, I, I think it goes actually back before COVID. I mean, mm -hmm. I think buyer behavior was changing probably two years before COVID. Um, and really that was through the drive that Amazon and other online retailers were driving behavior that people were researching items online. Um, prior to COVID, I think we were, we'd gone through a period where uh, people were researching online and retailers were responding, uh, not non-e-commerce, pure e-commerce retailers were responding by saying, okay, we can ship now from our stores or we can ship from a DC um, and we can you know, manage, manage uh, retail inventories uh, accordingly. What changed in the sort of six months prior to COVID was that model was becoming cost prohibitive. Mm. And I think there was you know, the, the returns costs um, and the shipping costs that retailers were experiencing from that model was having, making them take a look at how do we change this. It was also reducing the foot traffic through, through stores. Um, and that's critical if you've got a, a retailer with lots of brick and mortar stores. So the model was beginning to change to something called buy online pickup in store or BOPIS, um, where we as, we as consumers were really looking at um, items to buy online, doing our research, and then we'd place an order and the, the retailer would say, yes, I have that in your local store. And it would, it would then require you to drive to the store, um, pick up the item, um, you were placing your order and paying for it prior to you actually going and physically picking up the item. And what it meant for uh, the retailers is it was achieving two things. It was reducing the cost of the transaction and it was getting a, a, a consumer into their physical store where the likelihood is you're going to buy something else. So there was a cost reduction driver and a, a, a sales revenue driver that was taking us down this path to, to BOPIS. Mm -hmm. um, COVID has really just accelerated that. And I think now we're going to see as we transition through the sort of initial COVID impact and, and to the post sort of post COVID impact, what buyer behavior will be to say, well, actually, um, sanitation for me has now become a really important issue. And I do not want to be in a store where uh, there's lots of other um, potential harmful you know, bacteria um, and will BOPIS continue as it is today. Uh, but we're seeing more and more retailers driving their business model towards BOPIS um, rather than ship from store or ship from DC. And I think we'll see that trend continue. That's really interesting. And, and like you mentioned, many retailers were already trending towards that omni-channel approach uh, before COVID. But, and you, you kind of hit on this a little bit, but, uh, but COVID really served as a, a shot in the arm for some more of those strategies like BOPIS, like you mentioned. So right. it, it really accelerated in a short period of time, something that maybe we would have seen over a couple of years worth of innovation. I, I think so. And I, I think also it, it varies from, from vertical market to vertical market. If you look at, if you look at grocery, for instance, mm -hmm. most people buy their groceries by physically going to the store. But we saw a huge explosion of buy online, either pick up, you know, curbs, curbside pickup, or you'd have a, a, you know, an Uber Eats delivery or whatever it might be to, to your home. Right. Um, I, know, I know we did it and from Costco, which we've, we've never done that before. <laughs> right? We've always gone to Costco and visited there and, and come home with a, with a carload of, of product. Um, I think, so for grocery, um, there is a change. You've then got um, what I would call the discount retailers, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 dollar, the dollar stores. And then if you, if you go into the discount fashion and discount home good retailers, they rely on foot traffic. Much more difficult for them to adopt a BOPIS model. Um, BOPIS really is in those specialty retailers where they have a, a, a controlled supply of inventory through their store footprint where you can be relatively confident that you're going to have the item that you need in the store at the right time. Mm. Right. So as we talk about BOPIS and, and online shopping and things like that, um, with that being a, a wider trend these days, especially in the 
mid-COVID, post-COVID world. Uh, how does that then accentuate the importance of inventory accuracy? And maybe does that create more challenges for that when it, for, for retailers? It, it absolutely does. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the challenge for the retailer is um, historically they only count their inventory once or potentially twice a year. And that is the time when they will adjust their inventory records to reflect physical inventory. And so they've got a you know, very, very close to 100% accuracy at that particular point in mm -hmm. time. What, what the data proves, and, and we're an inventory counting company, um, got lots of data to prove this, is inventory accuracy degrades over time. Um, and, and it can be as much as 3% a month for certain categories of product that move very quickly or have high shrink. So immediately, the month following your inventory count, your inventory is inaccurate. So if you're relying on inventory accuracy to be able to support a BOPIS strategy, you need to be counting that inventory more frequently. And I think that's the change that we're seeing because what, it, what, what retailers have found is, yes, BOPIS is nice. Consumers like BOPIS as a concept, but if I go online and I order a, short, a shirt in a particular size and a color, and the inventory's, inventory uh, the record in the retailer tells them, yes, it's in Adrian's store, you know, five miles away, I'll place my order, on Saturday I'll go down to pick it up, guess what, if it's not there, because the inventory rac record is inaccurate, not only have they lost a sale, but they might have upset a, a customer, a loyal customer. So. Inventory accuracy sort of um, philosophy is now raising its, its position within a retail environment. Um, C-suite executives are now saying, we certainly don't want to lose revenue, and we certainly don't want to impact customer satisfaction. And inaccurate inventory records potentially can do that for us. So we need to be looking at driving greater inventory accuracy. Right, because customer experience these days has become, you know, a, a buzzword term, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, across the retail industry, right? Everyone's looking at how do we improve the customer experience? How do we give customers the best experience, whether it be online, in-store, a mixture of the two? And so having inventory accuracy issues certainly elevates, um, that, that elevates the problem, right? Because like you mentioned, an, an upset customer because you don't have the right. shirt that they ordered, all of a sudden this is now a larger issue than just inventory accuracy problems that they would have normally experienced, like you said, a month after counting anyways. Now this is an elevated issue that, that is a bigger problem for retailers it's to a, try to solve. It's, it's a bigger problem. So one, one response could be, well, I'm going to elevate my buffer stock. Mm. Right. So whereas um, typically I would want a minimum minimum quantity in the store of three or five or whatever the whatever the retailer might set as a buffer stock, in order to absorb this potential inventory inaccuracy, I'm going to make that six or seven. So what that means is they're now carrying more inventory in the store. The cost goes up. So I think there's a trade-off between do I do I perform more inventory counts more frequently, and there's a cost to that, obviously, in order to maintain a higher level of inventory accuracy, or do I change my the way I manage my inventory in my supply chain and have more inventory in the store rather than at the DC or or at my um, manufacturing? So DataScan provides a lot of data to retailers on their inventory accuracy, right? So tell me a little bit more about the data provided to retailers, and maybe some of the actions they can take as a result of the data that, that you provide. So when, when retailers perform an inventory, obviously there is a, a comparison between um, the, the inventory and the books and records of the retailer prior to the count, and then the physical count. And there will be discrepancies. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of the, the data um, result is they will research those analyses to understand well, what caused either a, a positive variance or a negative variance in certain items. And as you count them more frequently, you can begin to track that behavior um, and identify what in your supply chain or what in your uh, loss prevention you know, protocols are causing inventory inaccuracies in certain categories of product within your store. So we're able to provide that data by, by, um, research, by allowing the retailer to research the variances on the book to physical inventory counts. And the more frequently they count, the better data they get. Interesting. So when it comes to 
inventory tracking and, and, and figuring out exactly what you have in a store. Is this a one-size-fits-all kind of solution, or do different retailers, for instance, grocery versus you know a big box retailer, do they need different solutions when it comes to their inventory accuracy? Um, yes, I mean the, the 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 solutions vary across the industry. So. Um, in grocery, for instance, and, and in some big box, the, the volume of items in the store are so great that mm. they physically can't have enough people from, of their own uh, staff to be able to perform the count. So they need to be able to be bringing third party you know, staff into the store to perform the count. Um, equally, um, if you go along in a grocery store and there's a shelf of you know, tins of beans, you don't need to be scanning each individual tin of beans. That would take right? you all day. It would take yes, it takes yeah. way too long. <laughs> so there is something called bulk entry. So you you scan one and then you do a physical count and you enter thirty five or fifty or whatever it might be. That model doesn't work in a, in your high end department store where you want to be tracking you know size, color, um, style, etc. Uh, where you need to be scanning each individual item. Um, equally, in, in those stores and some other specialty stores, you've got um, you know, sporting goods stores, you've got shoe stores, um, excuse me, home goods stores. Uh, he, the density of product versus the density of staff is right, that the retailer's own staff can perform those counts, and they'll do them with more knowledge about the product. So if they, under, they, they will understand if, if this style is different than this style, or if it, maybe there's a mislabeling that they'll pick up on, which a, um, no disrespect to the third party counters, but they won't notice that. It's not their product that they're counting. Right. Um, so I think there are retailers which are well set up to perform self-scan counts with their own staff, and there are retailers where the model doesn't work for that, and they'll need to continue to use um, the third party service. Um, what's changing in some of those bigger box stores is they're identifying um, product groups or, or product um, areas that need more regular counting. So that transitions the thinking from, I'm going to do a once a year, twice a year, full physical inventory across the whole store, to I need to make sure that those particular categories, those, those particular products are kept accurate. Mm. And they'll do something called cycle counts um, or potentially category counts. Um, and that, that is another big change that's going on in the market where um, retailers are saying, I don't need to count everything at 50 cents in my store. I need to count the five, 10, $20 items in my store. And in the case of sort of higher end fashion, I need to count the higher value items to make sure those are accurate. So for instance, in a store like a, a Walmart that has something of everything, you might have different cycles and different, um, different uh, time intervals that you are counting certain departments or certain yes. items within certain departments. So then that cycle repeats on a regular basis, but depending on the department, depending on the product. Yeah, I think uh, perpetual inventory accuracy is not a new thing. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you'll, if you go to any sort of well-run warehouse, they're, they're performing true cycle counts throughout the year. That means they'll count everything in the warehouse at least once, and, and probably more than that. Um, over a period of time. It, stores are not really doing that yet. We may get there, but they're not doing it yet. What they're doing, and what retail calls cycle in the, um, in the store environment, is we want to count specific categories. Mm -hmm. So it might be you know, your high shrink items. So we come back to this um, notion of we perform a physical imagery count, and you've got your book record and your physical record, and as you build up that inventory um, sort of data over time, you can see, well, this particular product group is consistently bad. There's a, there's a consistent variance. We need to count that more regularly to understand what's going on there. Um, it might by, be high value items. So um, it, particularly in, in a Walmart or a Target store, um, you might say, well, I'm going to count my higher end electronics mm -hmm. um, because that's a significant value of inventory in the store and it may be it has a high potential for, for, for loss prevention. Um, so they might do that. Or they might say, well, I've got a seasonal pr you know, product mix coming in that's going to be a high volume seller over a period of time. I need to be counting those. Um, so I know how to replenish those when the, you know, so that I don't get out of stock. So I think retailers in the store are looking at a number of different ways to count items in the store 
that won't necessarily drive us to sort of full store physical inventories being done on a regular basis. Hmm. Does having a better understanding of your, your inventory accuracy allow retailers to then be more efficient when it comes to reorders or what you need at a specific time? Can that help retailers really create some efficiencies that then drive greater revenue and maybe bring some costs down and that sort of thing? Yes, I, I, it absolutely does. And I, I, you know, you know, if you look at the, the sort of major costs for a retailer in a, with a brick and mortar footprint, um, labor is a big, big driver. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, retailers are looking at how do they make best use of their labor within a store. Um, and then the, the second biggest one is their inventory carrying cost. Um, and that really stems from how do they manage their inventory from all the way through their supply chain, through manufacturing, distribution, and down to the store and then out to the, re out to the consumer. Uh, they're looking to maximize the volume of sales based on the minimum volume of inventory they have in their store. Right. Um, so this comes back to the notion of, well, I don't want to be carrying too much because it, it's not going to move. It's just going to sit there and take up real estate. Um, and I want to get that product to be churning through the supply chain. So I think that they're, they're looking at how do they maximize the efficiency of their inventory throughout that whole supply chain. And that might be cutting out um, you know, cutting out a, a, a set of product that comes through a DC and have it shipped direct from manufacturing direct to the store. Mm. Now, that introduces another area of risk, but that's something that each relay c retailer can judge to say, do I trust my, my manufacturer to send me the right product to the right store? Do I trust my store management and my inventory um, management systems to be placing the right replenishment orders when they're needed? And that all stems back to, is my inventory accurate? Right, right. So you, you took me right where I wanted to go, and that was talking about the entire supply chain as a whole and, and taking a look at that. Is there value in viewing the supply chain in total and, and not just focusing on specific aspects of it, but really looking at it in its entirety? Yes, and I, I wanted to touch on a, another subject, which is I mentioned loss prevention yes. before. Um, and loss prevention is really focused on um, you know, how do, we re how do we eliminate or reduce you know, shrinkage within the store? Mm -hmm. um, and it's traditionally been looking at malicious and non-malicious theft, if you like, um, within the store environment. Um, more recently, that, that concept has been extended. And it's, it's, it, when you talk about shrinkage and, and, and loss prevention, it sort of has a negative connotation. Uh, we're trying to you know, eliminate something that's bad. Um, there is... Um, a new, uh, a new class of discussion going around something called total retail loss, which is looking at where are there risks in the whole supply chain. Um, and, and I was talking to somebody this week and they were telling me that even total retail loss has a negative connotation because it has that loss, loss word in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so should we not be calling it profit maximization? And I think that's a very good description hmm. of what is now changing in the retail environment. And that's really looking at four key areas within a, within a retailer. You've got your, your corporate functions, you've got your e-commerce functions, you've got your distribution functions, and you've got your on-premise brick and mortar functions. And they're now looking at probably 40 different um, risk points within each of those four areas of the company, not necessarily only related to inventory tracking and inventory accuracy, but where is there risk in the supply chain um, that we could be um, either risking an, um, a, a cost component that we want to be, have better control over, over, or where are we driving more, where could we potentially drive more revenue? Mm. Um, and that, that I think is now a seed change in the sort of uh, traditional loss prevention function within a, within a retailer to looking at profit maximization across the whole organization. That's interesting. That, that's really interesting. I want to take a pivot real quick and talk about RFID because it's, it's been a trend that's been discussed for, for quite a while now. Um, but where does RFID currently stand in terms of uh, the value it can provide or being a viable solution for retailers? So, this is a really interesting one. I mean, I, 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 I've got the gray hairs to, to, to sort of show you the, the, the age of the, of the discussion here, but I remember going back to the late 90s mm -hmm. um, when there was this panacea in grocery that you would be able to put all of your grocery products in your, in your cart, wheel it through an arch, and everything would be fine. 
And here we are over 20 years later and it, it hasn't happened. Right. Um, there's been a lot of initiatives in and around the RFID world, um, not only for retail, but in, in other sectors of the market that has, has driven you know, tremendous technological advancement. Um, I think we're now, a lot of the, the history around um, RFID adoption and the, the, the sort of lack of RFID adoption in retail was driven around two things. Um, one was the cost component. Mm -hmm. And can you afford to put a, an expensive tag on every single item? And then there was this, the disruption from a systemic standpoint about how do I utilize RFID and the data that RFID would create within my other systems infrastructure? Um, you know, what, what inventory management system did I have? Uh, what POS system did I have in the store? Uh, what ERP system did I have and can they all talk together? So I think that was an inhibitor up until probably the last two years. Um, I think we're seeing now, we were right on the pre-COVID, pre we were right on the cusp of a real acceleration in the adoption of RFID at the unit level in the store. Mm. And we had a number of retailers and making announcements that have come out. Um, I mean, Macy's has been in the RFID world for a long time. Um, Nike, I think two years ago, came out with an, uh, you know, a, a statement that they were looking to be in the RFID market and were going to you know, drive RFID adoption in their store level. Um, and others that had come out and said the same thing. Um, COVID has, has really stopped that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know, retailers now face the challenge of uh, what do I need to do to get my, my brick and mortar investment back to profitability? And that's really around you know, driving volume, sales volume through that, that sort of resource. And I don't know yet whether there's a, um, a, a willingness to continue to, to accelerate the adoption of RFID implementations within the store environment. I think that will come. Um, we're seeing costs of tags now down in the three to five cent range. Um, we are seeing developments in the sort of historical challenging areas of products such as metals and, and liquids um, that, that, ta that RFID technology is now beginning to you know, cope with that challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I was with a, talking to another retailer recently and you know, they were challenged around, how, well, how do I tag my cosmetics? You know, we've got strange shaped you know, units. It's not all in nice little you know, oblong boxes. Um, we've got liquids that we have to deal with. How do we, how do we tag those items and get an, inventory, an accurate inventory. So uh, to answer your question, Tyler, I think that there, we're, as we come through this next sort of um, impact of COVID on our retail world, I think absolutely retailers will be looking to accelerate the adoption of RFID hmm. simply because RFI does, RFID reading of inventory in the store does give you that 98% accuracy of your inventory counts. So the panacea, and I, and I talked to uh, two or three CEOs of, of um, convenience store chains. You know, they have challenges around inventory accuracy the same way that, that others, others do. And I was talking about, well, how do you perform counts? And, and they really said, well, you know, you know we, we use a service, so we bring a service in and we count our stores. But our, our panacea is I want a, an RFID reader in the ceiling and I want to come in the morning and press a button and it reads everything in the store. <laughs> okay, wonderful. We all want that. Yeah. Um, we're, not yet, we're not yet there, mm -hmm. but I see that there is, there is an interim stage where you will get um, items that are tagged at manufacturing to the retailer's accepted standard that will be you know, um, tracked through their supply chain down to the store and then you will have RFID reads going on in the store. Hmm. How much do you see changing store models uh, maybe disrupting or affecting inventory accuracy? I, I think, for instance, the, the Amazon stores, right, where you, you know, just put it in your basket and you walk out. Or the Sam's right. Club has, a, has one of those here in, here in Dallas as well. How do you see stores like that maybe changing or, or shifting some paradigms? Or, or does it present any new challenges when it comes to inventory accuracy? I think there's two things there in terms of the, the inventory, sorry, the, the retail experience that mm -hmm. we as consumers are looking for. Um, and I think that is going to continue to evolve. And, and I, I, there, there is this word experiential, right? That, you know, retailers want now to, sh to bring, attract people into their stores through a better experience or a different experience. Mm -hmm. 
So you're seeing people, um, retailers now adopting a different model for their stores. And um, you know, I, it, you know, we're seeing people like uh, Tommy Bahama, for instance, if you go out to their store in, in Legacy West, they have, they have their, their restaurant right next door to the store, and there's a big opening between the restaurant and the store. So you've got shoppers coming in to eat, shop at the same time. Um, there is a very interesting new store over in uh, South Lake that Macy's have opened. I don't know if it, you know, your, your, your viewers have been there yet. That is a totally new concept um, uh, for a Macy's, you know, a traditional Macy's store that is adopting different and new technologies about how do they bring people into the store and sell product. Um, so it, the, the changes that are going on in the way retail stores are designed are, are, are there to attract people to the store. Mm -hmm. Um, it still doesn't get over the fact that you still need to count inventory for it to be accurate. Right. So I don't think that different, the different experiences that retailers are trying to create for, for, retail, for, for consumers will actually change their behavior in terms of wanting to keep the inventory accurate. Mm. Technology will help that, uh, process will help that, and, and, and that's process throughout the supply chain. Well, nothing makes me want to buy a Tommy Bahama shirt more than uh, drinking a pina colada. So if I could get both of those at the same time, you know, that's... It's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, um, you, you can tell by the accent that I'm, I'm, I'm not from, from Texas originally. But so I grew up in the, in the UK and, and I'm, you know, um, still keep in contact with what's going on in retail in the UK. And mm -hmm. you're now in, in London, you're seeing, you know, you've got Prosecco bars opening up in, in, in stores. Um, you've got gyms. Um, you know, being open, you know, opened up in a store. So people are trying to attract consumers to a, a, a brick and mortar environment that may, you may be doing more than just going into shop. Mm -hmm. You know, you know um, and I think we're seeing that. I mean, my, um, my local Whole Foods here, um, they have a wine bar, you know, in the store. Yeah. Um, and you can go in and have a glass of wine, have a glass of beer and watch the game, right? Can't do it now because it's closed. Mm -hmm. But you know, pre-COVID and post-COVID, you could. So I think you know, buyer behavior is going to change um, and, and, and you know, attract more people into the store to buy. They can only buy if the right inventory is there at the right time. Uh, and that's this challenge that retailers have around inventory accuracy. Do retailers have a sense of how they expect buyer behavior to change again once we are more further beyond COVID-19? Do they expect BOPIS to stay as high and popular as it's been during this time? Or do they expect that maybe things level out and there's a middle ground between where we are now when it comes to ordering online um, and, and then like actual physical visitors within the brick and mortar space? I think that the, the current view is that BOPIS is, is going to be a trend that will be adopted by many more retailers over the, over mm. the next 24, 36 months is our, is our expectation. It's what we're hearing from, from our client base. Um, those that adopted it early have seen very good results. Um, and I think you know, they are the sort of more transformative retail, retailers. Um, those that have, are, are reacting as a result of sort of COVID impact, um, I think they will just accelerate that strategy within their organization. Interesting. Um, so yes, I think BOPIS is the next sort of big thing for retail. I think there is a generational, you know, generational component too in terms of whether I'm willing to just purely buy online and have it shipped to my home um, and I'm going to take the risk that it, do that it doesn't fit or I don't like it or whatever it might be uh, and I'm just going to return it all. Um, so there is a generational component as, as to how different generations want to interact with a retailer. Um, we're seeing a huge, obviously, I mean, you know, Amazon and, and Walmart's online presence is just enormous. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that will continue to grow. Um, and I think that you know, Amazon and, 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 and Walmart will be a great um, channel too. I mean, that it, one, one of the things we don't necessarily talk about is um, Amazon is a fantastic channel for small and medium-sized manufacturers. Um, and that, that, that channel is really growing fast, and I think that, that, that will continue to be a trend. I think we, we will still see, need to see brick and mortar shrink. Mm -hmm. um, I think there will, there's unprofitable stores within a lot of retailers, and you're seeing that, that press is, is sort of every, every week um, another retailer is announcing either a, you know, some sort of store closure. Um, and I think that will continue until brick and mortar reaches a sort of equilibrium. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, we are still, as human beings and consumers, I, I feel that way, still wanting to go and touch and feel product. 
Um, and we may do the research online beforehand. We may place an order online beforehand. And this is another um, a new trend is um, BOPIS was buying online. So you, you'd go online, you'd research your item, you'd place your order, it, you'd pay for it, mm -hmm. and you'd, then you'd get it confirmed. The, the, newer, the new one that's coming out is you, you simply reserve it online. So you're not actually paying for it. Right. You're, not, you're not actually making that transaction until you get into the store. And it'll be interesting to see whether that changes anything within the sort of um, consumer-retailer relationship. Um, whereas retailers are thinking, well, if you only reserve it, you're going to have to come into the store, mm. right? Um, and it still accomplishes that goal of getting it, people it, in store. It does. Yeah. So it comes back to that same philosophy that you have in a grocery store where they'll, you know, they'll put items next to the checkout that they think you're going to pick up on, on, just on spec, right? So you go in and pick up a pack of gum or a, a, some sort of drink or a magazine. You're going to do that while you're standing in the queue. Not quite the same in a Nordstrom store, but you're, if you're in the store, you're much more likely to buy something else. Mm -hmm. Grab some sunglasses while you're there or yeah. something. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think the, you know, that will also drive um, the whole, the adoption of mobile applications and concierging um, it, with the interaction of retailers with their consumers. So if they know, they know that I've gone online and I've ordered this shirt and I'm going to be coming in to pick it up. The interesting thing now is if, if, I'm, on, if I'm on a favorite retailer's mobile app, mm there's the technology to, un to know when I walk into that store, right? And when I walk into that store, they will connect the fact that I'm coming in to buy this shirt or pick it up, and they might want to send me a message to say, while you're in the store, Adrian, why don't you take a look at this pair of pants or, or whatever else I've got in my buying you know, background that they're going to be trying to market to me through over the mobile application um, driven by the fact that I've I'm, I'm initiated a transaction. Right. This tie would look good with the shirt you just bought. Yeah. Why don't you put those two together? Correct. You could yeah. offer a discount while they're in store or something. You know, There's something all sorts of couponing going on in that right. environment as well. So yes, I think that the, the use of mobile technology and the way mobile technology will enable uh, retailers to communicate with, with us as consumers is going to accelerate as well. That's fascinating. It's fascinating to think about the future of retail and yep. everything that's coming down the pipeline. But as we wrap up this conversation today, Adrian, I wanted to give you the opportunity just to provide a, a summary of the benefits of inventory accuracy and, and what you provide at, at DataScan. Because obviously, we've covered a lot of ground today. We've talked a lot about uh, the, the current state of retail. But just to, to give us a good summation of, of where we are right now in terms of inventory accuracy and what DataScan does. Thank you. Um, First of all, thank you for the opportunity to come in today. Absolutely. It's been, I've enjoyed the conversation. It's been a pleasure. Um, so retailers have struggled with inventory accuracy for many years, and, and they've been prepared to accept some element of, of shrinkage, and, and they've driven you know, processes around how do we reduce shrinkage, and they've accepted the fact that inventory degrades over time, and they've adopted strategies um, to sort of mitigate that impact. What we're seeing pre-COVID pre that was beginning and then driven and accelerated by COVID is this, this very strong driver to, to um, have perpetual inventory accuracy, maybe not in all items in the store, but in the high value, high volume, high shrinkage items in the store. You need to count that mm -hmm. to, to be able to do that. You need to count re frequently and be updating your inventory records frequently to meet customer demand and customer expectations. Um, what, what, what DataScan does is we provide, very, very simply, we provide count solutions. Um, and that can be a full inventory across all of your store. It can be, I need to count, you know, we're going back to school and I need to count footwear, so I'm going to count footwear. Um, or I need to do what we talked about earlier, which is these cycle counts for um, specific categories in the store that you want to count more frequency. So we have clients that do the whole gamut. Um, Tradition, our traditional base has been that physical inventory once a year, big bang count. Um, we're now seeing the requests through, we, we want to count categories specifically at times of the year. And most recently, now we want to implement some form of cycle counting where we're counting this risk, these riskier or the potentially riskier categories on a more frequent basis. Mm. Adrian Thomas, President and CEO of DataScan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Th Tyler, thank you very much indeed. Appreciate it.